I've been reading a book about political campaigns, which is a dangerous thing for a pastor to do at any time, but especially during Advent as the sorts of passages that come up through the lectionary. Um, but I've been thinking about how our political views develop and when we become to come to some political awareness and been thinking uh, through my own political views and when I came to a political awareness myself. I grew up in a house where we didn't talk politics at all. Maybe you grew up in similar homes. I never knew how my parents voted. I have no memories of my parents staying, standing in front of the TV and cussing out either Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton. But I always thought politics was interesting. As a child, I never knew what was at stake, but on the television, politics looked like sports, and I liked sports. There were different political teams. Each team had their own colors and uniforms. The fans were cheering and waving flags and wearing silly hats, and when they weren't cheering, they were booing the other side. There were winners. There were losers. There was lots of cheating. I could get into this. As I got older, I started to learn that politics was in part about ideas. It was about the polis, the city, the body of citizens and how they organized themselves. Different people thought different values were important. Different people thought different problems needed to be addressed. I went off to college with zero political awareness. All I was concerned about was practicing my trombone. But as my friends talked politics here and there, I slowly started understanding what each party stood for, what they valued. Well, the fall of 2000 was the first time I became engaged engaged in the political debate in any way, the first time I had a strong opinion about anything political. And that happened to be the same fall that I started seminary and started studying the Bible in earnest. And what blew my mind was that the Bible had opinions about politics. I'd never heard this before. I didn't hear about this in my home church when I was growing up, but it was soon explained to me that usually people didn't feel comfortable talking about politics in church. It just didn't go over very well. And it was explained to me as well that there was actually a law that prohibited churches from engaging the political debate too directly. Or at least this law provided strong disincentive for if churches endorsed a political candidate, they were at risk of losing their tax-exempt status. Nobody likes taxes, especially not churches, so we stay out of the fray. But here I am in seminary. I'm discovering these two completely different worlds for the first time. I'm discovering the world of politics. The prob I'm thinking about the problems that are facing the nation and the world, and there's a big debate about which problems matter and whose problems matter and what should be most important. And I'm loving it. It's interesting. And at the same time, I'm discovering this world of the Bible. And the Bible is talking about lots of the same stuff that the people in the political debates over here are talking about. These two separate worlds that are new to me, I find, converge. They collide. But as soon as I mention this to people, they say, shh, we have to keep these worlds separate. And I thought, and I still think, well, that's silly. How can we do that? No, we don't. They overlap. There's nothing we can do about that. What we can do, though, is talk as honestly as possible about what the Bible does say and then be as considerate as possible when we're talking with one another about what this means in our time and what God is calling us to do in response. So when we read Psalm 72, we're reading a psalm that has opinions about politics. It has opinions on what values leaders should hold and what problems they should try to solve, what constituency they should be focused on. It says, give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. What language? Crush the oppressor. Likewise, our passage from Isaiah for today has opinions about politics too. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or what, by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. 
Now, you may have noticed that sometimes our political leaders get corrupted by their own ambitions or by money, and they lose sight of the needs of the people. Now, this happened in ancient Israel, too. A common problem in ancient Israel was that the king would use his power and the money generated from taxes to build up his military and go off and fight wars, to try to make a name for the nation of Israel and give it standing among the League of Nations or the nations of the earth. Meanwhile, people at home needed that money and they starved. Or the king would decide to build some nice buildings that would be a lasting symbol of his glory and power and might. But to do this, he had to enslave the people as laborers. The labor was being used to build unnecessary buildings rather than to grow crops, and the people starved. Our passages for today are protests against the standard practices of the kings of ancient Israel, and they express the dream of a king with different values and a different focus. They're saying, the problem isn't that the nation of Israel doesn't measure up to other nations. The problem is that people are starving. The problem isn't that we don't have nice buildings. The problem is that you're enslaving the people and their labor is being used for selfish ends. And then the passages say, oh God, please give us a king that is focused on caring for the people. People are starving. People are being taken advantage of by the wealthy. They need someone to be an advocate on their behalf. Give us a king like this, O oh God, and let this king rule forever. If Psalm 72 had been written today, it might sound something like this. O oh God, give the president and Congress your justice. Give them, and whoever is elected after them, a moral transformation. This is what righteousness can mean, a moral transformation. May they do right by your people, and not only the wealthy and the middle class, but may they also defend the cause of the poor and give deliverance to the needy and crush those who take advantage of the vulnerable. As we go through Advent and prepare for the coming of the Christ child, we read passages like these, and we see Jesus in them. Jesus is a Messiah like this, we say. Jesus is our King, and He will always be focused on delivering the poor and the needy, and He will work like crazy to focus us on delivering the poor and the needy. It's important for us to know and to grapple with the fact that the Bible addresses is the biggest problems that we face, not just as individuals, but as nations too. As Christ comes into the world, political terms are thrown around. King, Prince of Peace, Savior, which was something reserved for Caesar, Messiah. This is like saying Jesus will be the good president. Jesus will be the do-something Congress. The Bible speaks to big problems at the same time that it speaks to what we deal with in our individual lives. Passages like Psalm 72 and Isaiah 11 offer us a set of values by which we can judge our leaders and their action or inaction. And passages like these also direct our actions as Christians. These passages are saying, as the Christ child is born into our lives again, this child will turn us toward one another to teach us to care for one another and make sure that our neighbor has what they need. Two experiences this week have been running through my head. One was a radio show that I heard. They were talking about the long-term unemployed, and they were talking with them. And so callers were calling into this show, and they were explaining their situation, saying, I've been out of work for 18 months. I've been out of work for two years. They were often people who earned six-figure salaries, architects, engineers, middle managers of one sort or another. They talked about struggling with whether or not to apply for part-time, low-wage jobs. They talked about competing with other professionals for those low-wage jobs and how difficult it was when they were working another job to be networking in their field to try to find the job that they really wanted. Some said they'd given up on working full-time ever again. They just didn't know how they could see it possibly happening. They talked about how they depended upon their unemployment checks. They hoped Congress would extend them that they never thought they'd be out of work for two years. I've also been thinking about a family that I met. They called the church asking for food. They'd been to the food pantry and they received a box. They'd eaten all of that. 
and it was the last week of the month. They had their food stamp card, but they'd gone through all the money on that card, and it's not filled again until the first of the month, so they needed some groceries to get them by. And so I asked what they needed, and they gave me a short list, and I went out and purchased some groceries, like 30 bucks worth of groceries. And I dropped them off. Their apartment building was a disaster. The apartment itself wasn't nice. We chatted for a little while. They'd moved up to Wisconsin from Missouri looking for work. She had a sister living near Boscobel, so they went there. And the sister was behind on her rent, and she ended up being evicted shortly after they arrived, so they're out on the street. And then they found their way to Dodgeville and found a place to live. They were going to try to stick it out through Christmas, and if they didn't find work, then they were going to go somewhere else. It's easy to know what justice looks like in these situations. Justice is everyone having enough. Justice is everyone having work. Justice is no one having to hop from one town to the next to try to find work or food. Justice is a government that functions, that provides a safety net so that you can find a different job after, when you're unemployed. It's one thing to know what justice looks like. It's another thing to know how we get there. And another to feel like we have power to act as individuals in the face of these big problems. But if there's one thing that Christmas tells us, it's how powerful the small things can be. Our Advent passages are focused on big problems. The world of the Bible has big problems. Our nation and our world have big problems. But the solution, salvation, comes in a small package. God sends a child, a baby. Baby. God sends the child and the baby to a small town a long ways away from Jerusalem, a long ways from any capital building. Even outside of town is where this child is born. And the baby is small. He makes people smile. The child helps people remember how vulnerable they are, how much they depend on God's grace for the whole of their existence. And out of this gratitude, they become more generous people, caring people people turn toward one another and this is part of what saves a small child reminding lots and lots of people that our small efforts to care for each other can be surprisingly powerful when they're put together what we can do even as we face these big problems is not to disregard our small actions to focus on our small actions and our small efforts if we are fortunate enough to have a job that provides enough, a retirement account that has enough, a pension that provides enough, if our Christmas celebration will be just as it always is, plenty of food, plenty of presents, we can thank God, and we should. Hopefully, by nurturing that sense of gratitude, we will feel free to share with our neighbors. Perhaps we give an extra gift somewhere, a little more to the joyful noise as the can goes around. We place something extra in the Salvation Army bucket or we pick up a few ba extra bags of groceries for the food pantry at the store. Our passage from Isaiah tells us a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. A marvelous big tree has been sawn off. It's cut down and all that's left is a stump. And salvation comes not as a big forest, not even as a nice-sized sapling you plant in the ground, but one little shoot that pops out the side of this stump. It's small. It doesn't replace the tree, but it's ready to grow, and it provides hope. During Advent, the Scriptures promise that God is engaged with the big issues of our world and our nation and our lives. And Advent suggests we look for God's action in small places. People remembering to give thanks for what they've been given. People allowing that gratitude to turn them outward. People giving extra where they haven't before. People finding some small way to care for their neighbor. Lots of people doing little things, making a big difference together. Lots of people doing little things that remind other people that caring for the most vulnerable among us really matters. This is a small shoot out of a small stump. It's hope for a better community and country and world. It's the same hope and same concern that the Christ child will bring. May it be so. Amen.